Hello, everyone. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about recovering changes in high lake head from INSAR data in the Central Valley of California. My name is Sogi Kang from Stanford University. Central Valley of California is one of the most productive farmland, farmland in uh, the world. And to maintain this agricultural productivity, it uses significant amount of surface water as well as groundwater. And severe droughts in California between 2012 and 16 has drastically increased the amount of groundwater usage in the valley, which has threatened the groundwater sustainability. With this, the Californian government legislated a Sustainable Groundwater Management Act called SIGMA in 2014. And by this act, um, we need to kind of, it is required to be equipped with an ability to monitor changes in groundwater head. And today, sort of my focus of the today's talk is sort of developing a methodology to monitor groundwater head, changes in groundwater head in high spatial and temporal resolution. So the Central Valley of California is composed of Northern Sacramento Valley and Southern Sacramento San Valley. And Southern San Joaquin Valley, more pumping of groundwater in the warmer, drier south causes more subsidence, as you can see in this uh, map of surface deformation. So red color means a large subsidence is about 25 centimeter per year. Aquifer system of the Central Valley composed of uh, mostly sediments like uh, clays and coarse grained materials like uh, sand and gravel. And there are numerous interbedded clays embedded in the coarse grained uh, materials. And the base is an impermeable base. Uh, it's like a, a marine sediment, so I have uh, lots of clays. And if you go to the southern part of the valley, there is a regional confining layer called Corcoran clay, and that divides the shallow aquifer and the deep aquifer. And shallow aquifer is unconfined, and deep aquifer is confined. And you can see the lateral extent of the Corcoran clay here. And as you can see, the large substance anomalies are included in this extent, kind of giving us, us a clue the major source of the deformation is from the deep confined aquifer. And much of the Central Valley system is best described as a sand confined due to um, this, like a, uh, this, this numerous intrabatic clay, which can act as a small confining unit. And overarching question that we have, how do we monitor changes in HAD? The traditional approach is well-based, which provides an accurate point information, and it provides a direct information about hydraulic hat or changes in hat. However, the spatial density of the well data is generally low, and the depth coverage is limited due to the increasing cost of the drilling with increasing depth. The shallow aquifer has a relatively good coverage, while deep aquifer has very poor coverage. So there is a large data gap in the deep aquifers, and that is our focus. How do we fill in this data gap? And what we're going to focus on is using a satellite interferometric synthetic aperture radar called insert technique to fill in this data gap. So we have a, a satellite here sending electromagnetic pulse, which can measure the phase, and you can the satellite can come to the same uh, place and then measure another phase, and this phase difference yeah, by kind of converting that into a deformation, surface deformation, we can measure the surface deformation from the satellite and that is basically the INSAR technique. And importantly, spatial and temporal changes in hydraulic head are encoded in the ground deformation resulting in surface deformation that can be measured by this INSAR technique. And INSAR technique has a great spatial coverage, high spatial density and good temporal sampling rate. And it is sensitive to the head in the deep uh, deeper aquifers, like uh, confined or semi-confined. However, what it provides is a direct information, indirect information about the head, because what we're measuring is the surface deformation. And there can be other factors affecting the deformation. So uh, we need to be careful about this limitation of the technique. And in our data in the Central Valley, we have about 1.7 million time series, which kind of covers most of the valley. And the lateral resolution is about 2,200 meter, and we measure every six to 12 days. We have a total of 284 time channels between 2015 to 2019. In head data, we have about 20,000 wells, including all types of wells, domestic irrigation monitoring, and lateral resolution, as you can see, highly variable. And importantly, the temporal sampling and coverage are very, very limited. So that kind of provides us a motivation to develop a new monitoring approach. Conceptual model of the surface deformation in the valley. So surface in the valley, surface deformation can uh, be uh, expressed as a sum of poro elastic response plus loading response. And I'm going to explain these two different responses now. So poro elastic response is basically due to the changes in head of the uh, aquifer. Suppose we got a deep aquifer here and we're pumping in from the deep aquifers. And with the pumping of groundwater, 
the head and this coarse grained materials in the deep aquifer uh, that it will reduce and that generates a different sort of head distribution between clays and coarse grained materials and that'll drain the water from clays to the coarse. And this is a diffusive process which takes a time and that will compact the interbatic clays, which result in the surface deformation that can be measured by the NSTAR data. And the reason why the major compaction is happening in the interbatic clays is due to the larger compressibility of the clay compared to the coarse grained materials. So what we're interested in is recovering this head change, which is the driving force of the system. And, but to do so, well, we, we also need to estimate the, the properties of the interbatic clays because that modulates the surface deformation. The second uh, response was the loading response. And uh, so any kind of form of water that can be added to the ground surface can, that can generate the loading response. So if you add the mass, it'll make the ground subsidence, but if you remove the mass, it'll generate the uplift. So when you remove the uh, mass, it's like a dry season or dry season. So you expect the uplift in either dry, dry season or uh, a, a, a dry season. Now we're going to uh, do a data analysis to explore relationship between head measurements and INSAR data. But again, uh, I want to emphasize the INSAR data can have both uh, changes in hydraulic -like head, like poor elastic response, as well as the loading response. So what we did, we did apply the, the cluster, we clustering algorithm. So if you look at the insert data, there are many different locations, and each location we got many different time channels. So what we are asking for, okay, what is the simple way to see both spatial and temporal patterns in the data? So we used the, what's called k-means clustering. So what we're asking to do for this algorithm, oh, give me six different cluster of the location. And so classify each location, each time series as a six different clusters. And that is the result. Black color is the cluster one, blue color means the cluster two, and other color means the other uh, clusters. And when we got a total of six clusters have different uh, temporal features. But even though we didn't use any spatial constraint, you can see the spatial correlation already, which is interesting. And we can also plot that up as a function of time for each clusters. And here, the blue color means the wet season and white color means the dry season. And cluster one, two, three, four, five, six has different, distinctive, distinctively different uh, time features or temporal features. And that's what we can obtain from the insert data. But now what we're interested in is the relationship between this insert data and the head measurements. So what we do, we find a co-located or co-located insert data and head measurements. So for a given insert data location, I'm gonna find any proximate insert data at the head, head, head measurements within one to two kilometer radius. So for cluster one, I'm gonna start with the cluster one. The so cluster one is occupies a 76% of the data, which is the majority of the data. And on the right-hand side, I'm showing the co-located data as a function of time. And uh, the left-hand axis is the head and right-hand axis is the deformation for the NSAR data. Again, wet means the blue color, dry means the uh, white color, and dry season, I kind of notify that as a red color. Okay, I'm starting with the head data in a wet season, it goes up, dry season goes down, goes up, goes down, so it oscillates. In a drought period, multiple years, it kind of goes down in general, okay? And then after the drought, it goes up, so it had this recovery. If you look at the NSAR data, it's completely opposite. In dry season, it goes up, and wet season goes down. Dry season goes up, wet season goes down. But it means it's due to the loading effect, because if you put more water on the wet season, it goes down. If you remove the water, on a dry season, it goes up. So cluster one is dominated by the loading effect. It's kind of unfortunate, but the majority of the INSAR data, it's pretty challenging to recover head from the INSAR data. And cluster, but, but cluster 260, which is another, uh, the other 24% of data, it's what we can see is high level of subsidence. And the given severe droughts in the Central Valley, this large interannual subsidence is likely due to poor elastic effect. Because if this was due to the loading effect, it, the, what we see is the high level of uplift, but that's not the case. So cluster two to six is dominated by the poor elastic effect. So we have some promise to recover head from uh, the insert data for these uh, clusters. So for a given a limited time, I'm just going to show, only show the cluster five, uh, which shows a very low, high level, large subsidence. It's about uh, 80 centimeter for five years, um, which is pretty large. And I'm showing the co-located data for cluster five. Again, 
blue means wet, wet season and uh, uh, white means a dry season, red color means drought period. So if I start with the head data and a drought period, head goes down, although it's kind of oscillate by season. And the right after the drought, head starts goes up and then go down and go up. And now if I look at the insert data, in the drought period, the, the, there's a large level of subsidence. And even after the drought, there is still high level of subsidence. And although the head data is somewhat increasing, so it were plateaued. So this subsidence is mainly due to the historical head drops happened here. So sometimes it's called deferred signal or delayed signals. And similar things happen with the high, high level of increase in head and the insert data is plateaued and goes down with decreasing head. Even if with the increasing head, it's sort of just sort of plateaued, right? So we can see the good correlation between insert data and uh, head measurements in this case, okay? So here's a quick summary for cluster one. The 76% of the insert data were dominated by the loading effect, which was the cluster one. And this kind of provided us a need to remove this loading effect that somehow in the insert data for the recovery of uh, head measurements from the insert data. For cluster two to six, this is what we're, we're interested. We identified strong correlation between the head measurements and the insert data for the rest of, for the other 24% of the data, as you can see here. And for this location, we got high level of potential for recovering head measurements from the insert data. And that is the next topic. So what we're going to do, we're going to recover head measurement from the insert data. So in a very simple manner, four problem can be set it up like this for given head and the coarse grained materials of the uh, deep uh, confined aquifer. Uh, we have a function f that generates the insert data. But what we want is going backward. For given insert data, observed insert data, we want to measure what is the uh, coarse head of the coarse grain, the material that can explain the measured insert data. We also need to know the geomechanical properties of the clays for this problem, but we're going to assume that that is known. And the reason why uh, we could do this, uh, it's uh, because of my selection of the location of the insert data within the cluster five, it's about here. And this is the location where Smith and Knight worked on uh, for inverting for geomechanical properties of the clays for given insert data and head data. So I'm gonna use uh, their properties, their estimated properties. And here kind of to have a representative insert data. So I just pick the location and draw a circle and average all of the insert data within that circle. So that mean is my observed insert data. And here's my inversion setup. So right hand axis, uh, left hand axis is the head and right hand axis is an information. So this is my initial guess. Decreasing head, it's about 20 meter, 12 meter per year decrease. And uh, this is the observed insert data. So if I invert that, okay, and that is the predicted insert data. So I'm fitting the data pretty well. And that is the recovery. So I don't have much sensitivity at the time period where we don't have the insert data, but I had to update my initial head to actually fit the observed insert data. And that is where we got the sensitivity. And yet it's hard to know whether this is meaningful or not. So, but if we actually compare that with the co-located data for the cluster five that we, uh, that I have shown before, we can actually see pretty good correlation at the time period where we got the insert data. So you see, goes up, goes up, goes down, goes down. And so the plateaued goes down, down, and goes up, goes up. And we don't have the data, but we actually can have the data because we have the insert data at this time period. And the time sampling uh, of our recovery is much better compared to very sparse at the measurements. Okay. So here's like uh, what we can see the value of using insert data to recover at measurements. Okay. So here's my concluding remark. Despite the sort of the remaining challenge that we have, like kind of estimating geomechanical properties of clays uh, in conjunction with estimating head measurements from the insert data, we showed the potential to utilize the insert data as a tool to monitor head changes in the semi-confined or confined aquifers in the Central Valley of California. And yeah, we're quite excited to extend this study to the entire Central Valley such that we can um, recover head measurement from the, the insert data within the entire Central Valley. Thank you very much. And yeah, we appreciate all of the uh, funders and uh, collaborators of this study. Thank you very much.